Have you ever had a bad day? Yeah, this morning, right? Uh, as somebody told me years ago that um, all the best marriage fights happen on the way to church, don't they? Right? Because it's like you're just, <laughs> wow, a lot of amens on that one. I don't, <laughs> we need, maybe we need to do a series on marriage next week or ne- next after this series, we'll start that. Um, but that's just the reality. Like you have a bad day and I don't, I don't mean a bad day to where you just like, I don't know if you ever done that where you wear like two different shoes to work. Um, you ever had that happen before? Um, but I'm talking like the kind of bad day that where everything just seems to go wrong. You spill your coffee on your work shirt that morning. Uh, you got a flat tire on the way to work. You're late to work. You have a big presentation. You, you bomb the presentation. It doesn't go well. Um, you, get, you get to the end of your day and it's just like, could anything else go wrong today? There's a, there's a dad saying, right, that we have for this. And, and he, your dads probably say it. And we even say it now when bad things happen to us in waves, what do we say? When it rains... It pours, right? Like we overuse that statement probably because even if it's like one bad thing, we're like, well, when it rains, it pours. You know, like your life's great. Like, what are you talking about? But that's, that's just the feeling we get, right? You have those bad days, you have those bad weeks where things aren't just going the way that you want them to. But here's the, here's the good news is that uh, you're not alone and you're not the only one that is having a bad day. If you go to Google and you type in having a bad day, I found this out this week in my prep, you can find hundreds and hundreds of blogs and articles of people sharing their story where they had probably worse days than you're having at their workplace. And there is something twisted about the human mind that enjoys seeing other people suffer, isn't there? <laughs> Today, we're going to look at the, back at the prophet Habakkuk. Um, if you're new with us, we started a new series last week, and um, Habakkuk is, seems to be having um, a pretty rough go at life at this moment. Um, and he's, he's, co- he's complaining or lamenting to the Lord, and he's crying out to the Lord, um, and he's having what seems to be a rough go. And, and here's the hard part about it. And what we're going to see today is that Habakkuk's rough go at life is not over yet. It's going to get worse. And there's more rough times on the way. And it, it can almost feel, as we read this passage today, it's going to feel a little bit, little bit like pile it on or when it rains, it pours kind of moment between Habakkuk and God. And, God. and last week, Josh uh, spoke a great message on the gift and the discipline of lament. When we are finding ourselves in difficult situations and challenging seasons that we can lament to the Lord all throughout the scriptures. You read the Old Testament, often the prophets and the people of God would lament. They would, they would cry out to God like, God, where are you? But there, is mo- there are moments and times in our life where we have kind of convinced ourselves that the Lord can't handle our questioning or even our doubt. The reality is, is that he can handle it. He already knows it, right? As Josh talked about last week, he knows your thoughts. He knows what you're going through. So there's something healthy about confessing those things already happening in your heart to the Lord. And so Josh talked about the first four opening verses where he, he laments in boldness and honesty. And he is a powerful moment. Habakkuk has seen the moral and spiritual decline of the people of God, specifically Judah. They've turned their back on Yahweh, on following the Lord in the laments, like, God, where are you? How could you sit idly by and watch this take place? Uh, and today what we're going to see is God's response to, to Habakkuk's lament. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Habakkuk chapter 1 again. Um, if you're new to the Bible, or um, I probably shouldn't say that because everybody has a hard time finding Habakkuk, right? You just go to Matthew, flip over a couple books to your left, and you'll find Habakkuk. It's a minor prophet. Uh, if you don't have a, a, real, a, a Bible, there's some Bibles on the table in the back. We'd love for that to be a gift to you. We're going to read verses 5 through 11. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press loudly on their horse, press proudly on, excuse me. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces for they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. At rulers they laugh. They, they laugh at every fortress. They pile up earth and take it. Verse 11. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. This is a challenging passage of scripture this morning that we're going to dive into and study. Um, 
because this feels a little bit like, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you ever had one of those days or one of those weeks and at the end of the day or the end of the week, you get an email critiquing something that you have done in your performance in your job. You ever notice that those critique emails never come when things are going well? never comes when things are happening, right? It's always when you're having a bad week and it's like, okay, just pile it on, just bring it in, just give it to me. You ever feel like that with life? It happens. And it can, it can take that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, look at it when we look at this passage. But here's what I want you to hear this morning is that in this passage, it doesn't look good, but there's purpose still in what is going on and what God is doing in this passage. Let's look at the main idea this morning before we jump back in is this, our suffering and God's plans are guaranteed to surprise us in life. Our suffering and God's plans are guaranteed to surprise us in life. Now, if I was to ask you uh, 10 years ago and say, if you were to look back on 10 years ago and you, you are, where you are where you are with your life right now, uh, would you have dreamed where you are right now? No right? The, the Lord's plans are surprising in our life. We end up in places where like, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would be planting a church, I would say, you're crazy. I would never do something like that. Not a chance. I, I would rather be a youth pastor. I'd rather like go, go be on staff somewhere like that. That seems like what, what I wanted to do, but the Lord surprises us with his plans, doesn't he? But there's also a piece of this that in our suffering that we can be surprised often as we go throughout life. And so in this passage, we're going to spend most of our time in the first few verses. Let's look back at, look back at first vi- verse 5. Excuse me. Remember, Habakkuk laments and he cries out and he's crying to the Lord and he's, God, where are you? Uh, how long shall I cry for help? Will you not hear? Uh, you cry violence and you will not say. This is the lament that Habakkuk has and this is the answer that the Lord gives back to him. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. I want to stop right there. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. Have you ever seen something that takes your breath away? Husbands, is a, I lobbed it up for you, husbands. If you could just lean over and just say, it's you, baby. <laughs> right? Uh, there's, there's, there are things in this life that will take our breath away. It could be uh, uh, nature, um, one of the world's greatest uh, areas of nature that you might love to see your, your favorite place to travel. It might be architecture. Um, and so for, you, for Lindsay and I, a few years ago, we went to uh, New York City and we went to the top of the rock. If you've ever been to New York City, it's the top of the Rockefeller Plaza, the building. It's 70 stories high. And if you know me, uh, I don't do more than like one story. I don't like heights. I don't enjoy it. Um, but they take you on this elevator that goes faster than you want it to go. Uh, you get to the, I'm serious, it's, it's weird. You get to the top and after getting over the heights, you kind of settle and ground yourself when you can feel the building moving just a little bit. And I'm like, mm, I don't like that. Um, and you're standing up there and you open your eyes and all what you end up doing is just standing in awe and wonder that a city could be that large and that vast and that big. It, it's, it's almost breathtaking. You look at it and you think, how many big, large buildings can one city handle? How, how long does this little so-called island last in Manhattan? It seems like it goes on forever. There's this beauty to it and this awe and this wonder. You're like, wow, this, this is almost breathtaking. Habakkuk sees all the sinfulness and the decline around him, cries out to God and laments. And in a sense, God is saying, and in, in, in a sense, he's saying, God, where are you in the middle of this? Where are you in the middle of my pain? Where are you in the middle of the moral decline of your people? Like you've been absent, you haven't responded, they haven't done anything. And, 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 and God answers back to Habakkuk and says, I want you to take a look around and be astounded because I am at work. Now here's a biblical truth that we must hold on to. This is foundational for our faith is that just because we don't see God working doesn't mean he isn't working. Just because we don't see God working doesn't mean he isn't working. Um, We just sang about it, right? Josh, I'm not going to try to sing it, but he just sang about it, right? The team sang about it. It sounded really good. Like even even though we can't see it, we know that you are working, that you are moving. We have to have that foundational truth in us because part of the human problem is, is that we tend to only think in our time frame and in our own little world. We, we, from, from the time that we are a kid to now, uh, our main priority is the 70 to 90 years that we have on this earth. 
if we're lucky, right, 70 to 90 years, if we're healthy and things go well. Like we look at that and we think this is the most important part of my life because it is your life. There, there, is, there, is, a, there is something important about that. We want to make our life count, yes. But God is working outside of our concept of time. He's not working just to make sure that your life is beautiful and great and grand and everything is into place. Like God is working so that the entire world, he's holding it all together and he's working out his plan before us as we see it. And so sometimes what we need to do is step back from our life and our current situation and say, okay, God, I, I feel a little frustrated. I feel a little bit, dip, a little bit uh, upset with the situation that I'm in or the life and the season that I'm in lament through that, but also step back and say, okay, God, where are you working right now? Where are you working right now? He's working outside. He's keeping it all together. We can easily forget that God is playing the long game. He's working all things for his plan and not just our desires. And here's, here's a disclaimer I want to give you. This does not mean that God doesn't want to give good, good, give good gifts to his children or to help his kids and his children to have good lives. That is not what I'm saying, because I believe that. Scriptures say it, they proclaim it, that he's a good father, right? That he, if, if, if God is a good father, he gives good gifts to his children. We trust and we believe that. We don't think that we have to live a life of despair and a life, an entire life of lament. That's not what we're saying. But we do know and we do see that, that there are things in this world that we're going to have questions about. We're going to lament. But we have to know that he's working his plan for the world and for all time. Let's look back at the second half of verse 5. He says, For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. Now, this verse, this one line, if you were to take it out of context, it kind of sounds encouraging, doesn't it? It, maybe it's because of the uh, prosperity gospel that many of us have kind of grown up in. Um, we kind of get accustomed to like, we want good, encouraging words, right? We want to we be encouraged and leave like, oh, like I've been looking for a word. The Lord gave me a word and it's so encouraging. And it's lovely. And yes, but it says he's doing a work that we wouldn't believe. That has to be good, right? Sounds like a good old school preacher line. But basically what God is telling Habakkuk here is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Habakkuk laments, he cries out to God, God, where are you? I need, we need an answer. Like you see what's going on. There's, there, there's, there's turning away. They're not following you. They're, 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 they're living for idols. They haven't done what you've asked them to do. And the Lord looks back at Habakkuk and says, it's gonna get worse. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. How would you like this answer? God, where, where are you? Do, you? do you not see what is happening? Yeah, but... You're not going to believe what's coming. It's not good. Here's something for you to take notes with this morning. Faith is put into practice when what we see doesn't line up with what we believe. Faith, our faith is put into practice when what we see doesn't line up with what we believe. Because here's the, here's the truth that we know. It doesn't take much faith when we're living on the mountaintop, does it? Things are good. Your life is in order. You're not going through a difficult season. Like, yeah, oh, great. I, I, I don't need faith for that. Faith is tested and proved in the middle of the valleys and in the challenging circumstances that we walk through. That's where our faith is tested. That's where our faith grows. It happens in the valleys that we walk through. Let's look at verse six. <clears throat> for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. Who are these Chaldeans? As Josh said last week, this is what we call the nation of Babylon. Um, they were a fairly new nation at this time of the time of Habakkuk. Uh, and really, although powerful and although strong, it's in, in the grand scheme of history, this nation didn't last very long. This nation didn't last very long. Babylon was known as nasty. They were known as cruel, harsh. God even calls them ruthless. And they were powerful. And as we know the story, they became a thorn in the side of the people of Israel, the people of God. For 70 years, the Israelites lived in captivity in Babylon. As we know, the prophet Jeremiah writes about, uh, we see here Habakkuk, uh, the Lord is looking forward in the future right here with Habakkuk. And 
Babylon, they captured the area that we're living in. They, they, they do it by wiping out other nations that, off the face of the earth. And God says to Habakkuk, I am going to raise up the Babylonians to deal with the problem of Judah. This awful, harsh, brutal nation. I, God, am going to raise up this brutal nation to deal with my people who are disobeying me. Now, this is one of those verses and passages of scripture that's hard to take because I would bet that that's not the answer that Habakkuk expected. I sometimes wish that we could um, get a picture, a photo, a snap of a photo, right when God gives a word to somebody in the scriptures, if we could just see what their face looked like, I bet it was a pretty good shocked face. It's not what he expected. It's not what he thought was going to take place. But he says, listen, I'm going to raise up this awful nation and I'm going to send them to you, Habakkuk, to the people of God, to the people of Judah. I'm sending them straight to you. That, that doesn't sound very encouraging. Now, this reply that God gives to Habakkuk begs a question for us. How do we respond when God answers us and we don't like the answer? How do we respond in our walk with the Lord when God answers our prayer, but we don't like the answer to the prayer? That's what Habakkuk is facing here. He's, he's obviously doing the right things. He's loving the Lord and he's, he's praying out, lamenting God, where are you? And God answers him, but it's not the answer I bet he expected. Many times, we want God to do things our way, in our time frame, in the, and in the way that we want him to do it. And in essence, what we are saying is, I can be a better God than you. Now, we would never say that out loud, would we? Other, unless you're the preacher, evidently. But we would never say that out loud. We would never say, I can be a better God than you. And we, more than likely, we're not building golden idols in our homes today, right? We're way too sophisticated for that. But in our hearts, do we not have moments and times where we say, I'm not trusting what the Lord is doing here. And in essence, what we're saying is I can do this better than you, God. Isn't there a level of pride and idol worship that we have in our lives when we live like that? How is your faith when God answers your questions differently than you expected? Let's look back at the passage, verse 7. We're going to read verses 7 through 10. They are dreaded and fearsome. They, their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. Their horsemen press loudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence and all their faces for. They gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff, and rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. They pile up earth and take it. Now, um, I don't know if you're a horse person or not, and I know you, could, you can probably tell by looking at me, but I worked at a cowboy church for six years. That's a joke. <laughs> not that working there, but that I look like I would work there. Um, but I worked at this cowboy church, and I learned something. I grew up pretty much around horses. My neighbor growing up as a farrier, he shoot horses um, for a living, and somehow he always talked me into working for free for him. He's a great salesman. Um, but I had never really been around performance horses. There's a difference between a trail riding horse and a performance horse. Big difference. Trail riding horses, they, they're just happy to trot along and like, do, 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 do. Performance horses, they give them this thing they call hot feed, and it's like a Red Bull for horses. And they get, in, they get in that arena and they're, they're breathing hard. They got their bellies are expanded and they're sweating when they're just standing there. It, it, I'm telling you, it's, it's weird to sit on a horse that is a performance horse. Uh, I've only done it once or twice and it didn't go good either time. <laughs> Not good. Uh, I had one that ran across the arena on me. I was yanking on it. And right before I got to the fence, he slammed on his brakes finally. And thankfully, um, I got off the horse and said, I don't think I ever want to do that again. It's not very fun because it's, it's, it's out of control. It's the, and I'm looking at this passage thing, thinking, it says their, their horses are swifter than leopards. Think of the picture that, 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 that God is painting to Habakkuk here. Like, this is not just your average everyday army. These people are ruthless. They're fast. They're strong. They're mean. They're dreaded. They're fearsome. They, they answer to no one. It says in, in, verse, in verse 7, it says they, 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 uh, justice goes forth from themselves, meaning this, that there is no larger court that is, that is going to charge them with anything, that they are not account, accountable to anyone. This is like worst case scenario. Read this passage 
And I think about what's happening in Europe right now with, with Russia and Ukraine, right? It's, it's, re- it's real. We see what is taking place as they're bombing civilian buildings and the, the awful atrocities that are taking place across the globe. We look at that and it, the passages like this make more sense, don't they? It sure doesn't sound like someone God would use, does it? Because as followers of Jesus, followers of Yahweh, we want to be used by the Lord, right? We want to be used in his kingdom. We want to serve God. We want our, our lives to be known as service to the Lord, as worship, laying our lives on the, on, the, on the altar and say, God, whatever you want to do with me, I'm here. And so what do we do to be used by God? We want to earn our way and we want to live righteous, live holy, do all the things that we can control. All those things, good desires. But listen, there is a difference between being used in the kingdom of God and God using a sinful nation for his purpose. This is a very, very big distinction we have to make. All throughout scripture, God uses evil or sinful nations and sinful people to accomplish his purposes and his plans. But that does not give us an out, does it? There's still a desire that we should have, that we are following the Lord, we're serving the Lord, we're loving God with all our heart, and we're loving our neighbor as ourselves, we're doing the things that he's called us to do. Those things still apply, but God can still use evil nations like Babylon to accomplish his purpose. There's a couple of things that I want us to point out this morning, pull out of this passage, and the first is this, is that God rules over the nations. God rules over the nations. Here's a, a truth that we, we don't like to admit, but we know is that nations will come and go. Nations will come and go. Think about all the nations, even in our, our recent history that are no longer a, a nation anymore. Yugoslavia, you know, split up into multiple nations now. Uh, the USSR, which Putin is doing his best, right, to try to, 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 to recapture and redo. In Bible times, you have groups like the Ammonites and the Edomites, you have all these nations that, um, that are no longer a part of our world as we, as we used to know them. We could, we could probably go on for a long time naming those, but the truth of the matter is that nations are coming and going, and the one who rules them rules over all of them. God is not confined to one nation. He's not confined to one space. And here's a challenge that I try to give continually. I, and I want you to hear me. I I love our country and I love America, but God is not confined to America. Actually, most of the growth that's happening in the global church is happening way outside of America right now. It's happening in places like China where their life is on the line. It's happening in Iran where women pastors are leading a church underground that's growing at a rate that we've never seen in church history before. It's happening in places like that. It's happening in Cuba under a com- communist regime where they're, they're, they're not even allowed to build a building for a church, but they're knocking out walls in their homes so they can meet in their houses. The church as a whole is it, it, that God is not confined to a nation. Although I love America and I want, nation, I want America to be blessed by God, that's not, God is not confined here. He's not confined to, to Judah. He's not confined to all these other things. He rules the nations. And in the ancient Near East, it was common thought that each nation had its own God, meaning this, that each nation, each nation in, its, in its barriers and its boundaries, that there was a God that ruled over that one boundary area. This is illustrated in 2 Kings chapter, I think it's chapter 5. If you, if you write that down in your notes, if I'm wrong, send me a Facebook message and tell me I was wrong. But I think it's 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman um, has this encounter with the prophet Elisha. And he is healed from leprosy. And, and as he is going about, he asks, he asks Elisha, can you fill up my donkey with two loads of earth, meaning soil? The entire reason that Naaman wanted to have this earth, this dirt, is that so that when he went back to his nation of Syria, he could bow down on the soil of Israel, on the soil of the people of God, and worship Yahweh while on the soil of Israel, but in a different nation. There's this concept that we, it still bleeds into our life and our world that we, we, are, we, we, we think God is bound to a nation or to a soil. But we can forget that the Lord rules over the nations. And if God rules over the nations, don't you think that he can rule over your life as well? 
You see the comfort in that? If God can shape and move and control things in our world and in the nations around us, he can, he can, he can do that in our lives as well. In Judah's case, they were in complete rebellion, turned away from the Lord, and God says he's going to bring this awful, hateful, just harsh people, and he's going to use them to bring his own people back to himself. And what Habakkuk has to do in this moment is he has to plant himself in the truth that no matter what he sees, no matter what he is going through, no matter what the nation of Judah is facing at this time, that God is still on his throne. And there is a beauty in that statement that, that we as followers of Jesus, that we, when we look at our life and we see that we're in a season where it seems like we're surrounded by the enemy, we're in a season where it feels like it just isn't lining up with what I believe. And like, this is really challenging. This is difficult. And there's a season of lament and, and dryness. We have to trust and we have to know that God is still on his throne ruling and reigning. Verse 11. This is then they sweep by like the wind and they go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. God is raising up and he was going to raise up the Babylonians, uh, but this does not mean that they were guiltless or that they're now people of God. And here is this, this dichotomy that we see of God using sinful people, but for using them for holy purposes. It doesn't mean that they're now holy people. It says, what it says right there, it says that they go on, and they go on as guilty men. Babylon eventually would receive their own judgment. And really, the nation of Babylon only lasted for about a little, a little less than a, a full century. You think about the, the, the breadth and the length of history of time, like a century is not that long, right? It, it's not that long of a period of time. They didn't last very long. The Lord raised them up, but he also, what did he do? He brought them down. He raised this nation up to use them for his purposes, to bring the people of God back to Yahweh himself. Let's look at Psalm chapter two. It'll be on the screens as well. The, or the, the, the psalmist says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The, the kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away the cords from us. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord of hosts holds them in derision. The nations will come and go. They'll rise in power, but they plot in vain. And the Lord laughs at their plotting and their planning. Why? Because it is God alone who rules over the nations. Second thing that I want to support from this passage is that suffering is a reality that we all have to grapple with. Suffering is a, a reality that we all have to grapple with. And we know that this isn't a very enjoyable topic. Um, it doesn't feel encouraging like when, I, when, I, when these passages come up, and this is the beauty of teaching verse by verse or passage by passage, is that we don't get to skip these passages, right? We don't get to say, well, that, that, doesn't, feel, that doesn't feel very encouraging. That's not, that's not your best life now, so I'm going to move on to a different passage. We don't get to do that. But this is something that we all face, isn't it? This is challenging. Remember that Habakkuk is living a life for God. As far as we know, he's living a holy life, righteous, uh, uh, just blessed, like holy before the Lord, before Yahweh. He's, he's hearing from the Lord. He's, he, he's doing the things that God has asked him to do, yet he's about to face the most difficult situation that he will ever face in his life. This should serve as a reminder that suffering is not always because of our sin. Some of you need to really hear that this morning. Your suffering is not always because of your sin. Some of you grew up in a really legalistic household or a legalistic religion, and you have been convinced that any time that you suffer, it's because of some kind of sin that you have in your life, and you need to get rid of that sin. That's, that's not always the case. That's not always the reason. Um, it, that, that, yes, God can do that. He can cause suffering because of our choices, He's God, he can do that. We even see that now with Judah. Judah is living in sin. God's gonna raise the Babylonians up and he's gonna cause harm to them to bring them back to the Lord. But what about Habakkuk? He's living holy and righteous before the Lord, but he's still gonna face the same things that the sinful people are facing. 
It is, it is not good theology to tie, always tie our suffering to sin. Because here's the thing, when we live with the premise that our suffering is tied to our sin, it will cause us to turn away from the Lord when we face suffering, when we feel like that we're blameless. Do you feel that tension? It'll cause us to turn from the Lord or to question the Lord because, well, I'm blameless or I've been good. I, I, sure, I, I, might have, I might have said a bad word in my mind, but other than that, like I've been pretty good, Lord. Like I, I don't think this deserves suffering. Our suffering is not always tied to our sin. Here's the last thing that I want you to hear is that we don't suffer alone. We do not suffer alone. I think it's something that would be good for all of us to admit is that we cannot make it alone on this wild journey we call life alone. God did not design you that way. He did not call you to live that way. That's why we continually push community groups to you because we want you to be known and to have people know you and to share the most intimate details of your life with other believers because uh, there, are, there are things about, yeah, yes, this life is beautiful. There are great things, right? The birth of a child, uh, the promotion, the, 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 the things we look at and we're like, yes, those are good things. But life is also a road of hard times. It's like a, a good road in the city of Houston. There's potholes everywhere, right? Those of you that work in the city, you know. There's death, there's sickness, there's pain, there's misery. And when we end up trying to do it on our own, it really just boils down to pride, doesn't it? God never called you to do this life on your own, to suffer alone. What we should do as followers of Jesus is throw ourselves at his feet, lament as Josh talked about last week. And as we see here today, we trust that Jesus is still on the throne. Why? Why, why would we trust in a savior that allows us to go through suffering? Because as Jesus always does, he goes before us. You should think about that for a moment. Jesus does not ask you to do anything that he has not already walked through and been through himself. You're gonna, you're gonna find suffering. Guess what? Jesus went there. He walked through it. He led the way for us. Isaiah chapter 53, verse three through six. It says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought, brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He goes before us. He has been through it. He has suffered through it already. And in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our suffering, we can trust that Jesus has done it. If you're, because when you think about suffering, you're gonna face suffering in this life with or without God, aren't you? This is one of the big questions of um, people that don't trust in the Lord yet. Like, why, if, I, if God is so good, why do I? Why do we have suffering? How could a loving God allow people to suffer? But the reality is, is you're gonna suffer with or without him. Taking God out of the equation does not make your life easier, does it? It does not solve the problem of suffering. It only exacerbates it because as we look at it when, and, and what we know as, as believers in Jesus is that although there is suffering, it's sweeter when it's with Jesus. And in this prophecy by Isaiah, grief, suffering, sickness, sin, and death, they're all put into one package and they're all placed on the back and the shoulders of Jesus for you and for I. Jesus he holds us close when we lament our current circumstance because he's been there. When he was in a garden praying for his cup to pass, he's, he's finding himself in lament. Lord, let this cup pass from me. He, he, Jesus weeps with us when we weep in our pain because he's been there before. When he saw his friend Lazarus dead and Mary and Martha in the brokenness of their heart, what did Jesus do? He wept. He sees our suffering 
He sees our cries. And one day when eternity comes, Jesus, he's going to wipe the tears away from our face. And we'll be able to say it was all worth it. Just go bow your heads with me this morning. Our suffering and God's plans are guaranteed to surprise us in life. The challenge for us is how we respond when God's answer to us isn't something that we like. You cry out to the Lord, you lament, you, you shout out even like, Lord, where are you? Do you see what is going on? I, I don't understand, Lord. We, we need you in this moment. And he answers in the question that, you, that is answered. It's, it's not the way you want it. How do you respond in that moment? What if, what if God doesn't come the first time we pray? What if God is silent in the, in the darkest season of our life? How do we respond? It's something that we will all wrestle with, but it's also where our faith is tested. For some of you in the room, you, you're, you're living this out right now. You're living it out. You've, you have felt um, the emptiness. You have felt maybe even abandoned by the Lord at times because you're walking th through such a difficult and challenging situation. And I would say this, you need to trust and know that the Lord is still on his throne reigning and ruling today. And that doesn't just mean nations, that means over your life as well. Are you trusting that the Lord holds it all together? One of the silly songs we sing our kids or maybe you said, I don't know if everybody still does, but he's got the whole world in his hands. So simple yet so profound that he's holding it all together, right? That he's ruling and reigning and, and, and working out his plan for the world to come to know him. And he's using people that we might say, I, I probably wouldn't use that nation. They're pretty awful but he's using them for his glory, for his purpose. And then he's gonna tear them down. He's, he's, he's using all these things in our life so that we can come closer to him and experience a closeness with him. The suffering that we're wrestling with, the suffering that we're grappling with is challenging, yes. But we also need to know that we're not suffering alone. That death, sickness, pain, hurt, emptiness. Jesus knows all of those things. He has experienced all of those things. And we can look to him as a man that acquainted with our grief. He knows our grief. He knows our suffering. And you are not alone. And here's the last thing that I would tell you. It is not pointless. God will break us and shape us and mold us and these seasons of suffering so that we can be used greatly for his kingdom. And that's my prayer for you.